it has been a little while since we talked to Ashley Mulcahy and James Peretta of the group Lyrical. It's been actually almost a couple of years. I checked back uh, during to see our last interview, and it was December of uh, 2020. And I know a lot has been going on with uh, that musical duo since then. So, uh, Ashley, James, first of all, welcome back to QATV. Good to chat with you again. Thanks so much for having us. It's a pleasure. And I remember when we first chatted, I had never heard of uh, the bio. I had never heard of uh, the early colonial uh, voice uh, music. And uh, you have since um, produced your own uh, concert series. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So we've been operating since 2018, um, but we've always um, been presented by pre-existing concert series. And thanks in large part to grants from the, including from the Quincy Cultural Council, um, we're now in a position where we're able to self-produce our own concerts uh, starting in this 22-23 season. And we're super excited about that and about um, that new ability to bring self-produced concerts to our community here in Quincy. So how is it, how is it different to self-produce a concert as opposed to uh, being under the umbrella of another producer, you know, and what are the benefits of that? It's a lot more work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's um, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And especially, you know, just trying to get the word out. We're not coming in with, um, you know, the, we, we don't have someone else's audience that we're just borrowing and we're we're really, you know, working on building our own. Um, so we've been doing a lot more publicity work. Um, the benefit, though, is yeah. that we're able to, um, you know, really bring our concerts to the communities that we want to reach. Um, so there, to the best of our knowledge, was no pre-existing early music concert series here in Quincy. Um, despite the fact that Greater Boston is kind of internationally renowned for um, its early music activity, and we we wanted to bring that you know as as local as possible. Um, so that's you know kind of the the flip side of all the extra right. administrative work. So. Yeah, sure, sure, and we're happy to help you do that in our small part here at QATV. Maybe we should uh, you know take a step back. Uh, Twenty eighteen is when Lyrical, right, is, is what the group is called, was founded. Um, and let folks know what Lyrical is. Yeah, uh, so Lyrical is a group that is dedicated to music for uh, the voice and for the viola da gamba or the viol um, and instruments in that family. Um, there was a robust uh, historical tradition, uh, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, in Europe, um, of accompanying a singer with one vial. Um, the way that the instrument uh, is, is built and set up, uh, it has more strings than a cello, uh, but it also has frets like a guitar, um, but you still play it with a bow. And so you get this nice mix of a, a really nice sustained sound, um, but also um, the, the extra strings and the tuning and the frets make it so that you can play chords a lot more easily. Um, and so you can get this really unique sound that I think is, is uh, um, it gives you a very special way to accompany uh, the voice and, and get a really unique sound. And this was something that was done historically quite a bit, um, but is fairly uncommon in in modern practice. And so our main mission is to um, make that practice uh, more widely known and hopefully inspire some other people to, to take it up as well. Um, One really cool thing we like about the practice of accompanying a voice with a vial is that um, a lot of the, hmm, how do I say this? We know from many existing primary sources um, mostly written in in words <laughs> that people were were doing this. They were accompanying voices with files, um, but we don't necessarily have ex so much existing um, notation for voice and vile. So instead, it's a lot of um, putting together different contextual clues, and um, since we have a, a lack of documented notation, but a wealth of documented written sources about this practice, um, we've become really interested and invested in chasing um, people, players, mus music makers, rather than composers. 
Um, and that's kind of become part of our mission as well, to tell the stories of, of people throughout history who've engaged in this practice um, and put the focus there rather than, you know, who wrote for this practice, which kind of started as a, a practicality <laughs> because of the, the dearth of notation that I mentioned. Um, but actually, we found that we really liked that storytelling aspect um, and that focusing on the musicians rather than the composers has allowed us to, um, you know, just animate the experiences of a much broader range of people. So you're, I mean, in addition to musicians, you're also researchers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ashley does does most of the the let's say archival digging, <laughs> um, and then I come in and and make arrangements. Um, for for the things that we're we're actually going to play, whether that's um, you know taking a polyphonic, so like a f three, four, five, even six um, part piece of vocal music, and boiling it down so that uh, she can sing one line and I can play the others uh, on the viol, or um, looking at um, basso continuo notation where there's just a bass line and um, figures which are these numbers that tell you uh, basically it's it's kind of like a lead sheet um, from uh, the uh, I guess that would be more around the turn of the 17th, 17th century is when that started being being more of a thing um, and so you know that's something that I'll look at and you know either play from spontaneously or think about you know based on the text you know what needs to happen in this particular place or this particular place. Um, but yeah, that actually does a lot of reading and I do a lot of arranging <laughs> I and improvising. I'm sorry? And improvising as well as- And improvising, sort of yeah. Part of that. yeah. I think, um, and listening to you describe this, it reminds me a lot of the oral history of uh, the indigenous people of, of this country. You know, there, I mean, there's really not a lot written down about their music um, or their conversations, you know, or their language for that matter. Um, it's all it's all an oral history that continues through the generations. So how do you research that without without, you know, the contextual <laughs> folks who started it? This is how you do it, right? You talk to the to the existing folks uh and and look through their the writings that are available. Yeah, and it's it's um, you know, we're in some regards we're lucky that it's not really so much an oral history. It is in this case it is, you know, um, pretty well documented. That documentation just isn't um, the. It's very incomplete. It's incomplete, and the majority of it is um, historical and contextual rather than notation. Whereas if you go a hundred years later, let's say, and you're performing the music of Handel or Bach, we you have the music. You can sit down and you can play it. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, you're not kind of contextualizing it just to be able to play something you know there's there's already something there for you to play so right, exactly yeah so in many ways it's, it's harder uh, because you're creating before you're even performing and we love that about it yeah so, yeah. so you both you both live in quincy but uh and talk to us about your a little bit about your educational background if you could yeah uh so we both uh did our undergraduate degrees at the university of michigan um i started there as a cello performance major um, a few years into that, I actually also picked up a computer science degree. Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I have this sort of like dual track career going with, with music and, and computer science. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on a PhD at Northeastern in computer science, which I guess that's, that's new since the last time we talked, I think. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, also while I was at, while I was at Michigan, you know, I had already been getting into, uh, early music and playing Baroque music. And I studied a little bit on a Baroque cello um, with a teacher there and saw one of that teacher's other students uh, playing playing the viol and thought, oh, that's cool. I'll pick that up. Uh, and then a few years later, I picked it up and fell in love. And that's, uh, <laughs> and that's sort of my main, uh, my main instrument right now. And actually, yeah. voice, voice behind the music, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess my education is somewhat more traditional. <laughs> I, you know, also went to University of Michigan for my undergraduate degree, got um, a Bachelor of Music in Vocal Performance, just very broad exposure to lots of different types of classical singing. Um, I also concurrently 
did a Bachelor of Arts degree in Italian language and literature, which um, is great because it now allows me to do a lot of research in in Italian <laughs> and um, you know translate for us when we when we do Italian repertoire. Um, and then I took two gap years and then went on um, to Yale University School of Music and Institute of Sacred Music um, for a very specialized <laughs> master's degree in a program um, that goes by the nickname of Foxtet Program. <laughs> Basically, it's um, an octet of singers, a two-year program, so four singers every year, one soprano, one alto, one tenor, one bass. And um, you, you know, that group of eight singers sings a lot, um, a lot, a lot is an understatement <laughs> every day <laughs> together. <laughs> um, and, you know, we worked on um, chamber music and choral music, but also very intensive um, solo training and kind of the easiest way to say it is everything except opera. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> early music, choral, chamber, art song, um, it was incredible. <laughs> it's, 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 I must say it's inspiring to see young people such as yourselves uh, so excited about uh, music that dates back <laughs> centuries. Um, do you find that your audiences, um, who are your audiences, would you say? We're still kind of We're still figuring, figuring that, that out. out, you know, as our self, first self-produced venture. Um, yeah. You know, traditional early music audiences are not our age, <laughs> by and large. Um, and, you know, we're trying to reach um, broader audiences, um, you know, by keeping our ticket costs kind of um, at lower than the average, <laughs> maybe for the area of greater Boston. And also, um, you know, we're, we're very aware that we're living in a community with, um, that's a beautifully multinational. Um, and, you know, we're trying to um, make our concerts accessible to as many people in Quincy as possible. So we've hired a translator who's another one of my fabulous singing colleagues um, to translate the texts and spoken bits of our upcoming concert um, into Chinese so that, um, you know, we're able to reach more people in our community and, and hopefully have a more diverse audience as well than you might typically find at an early music concert. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. And uh, we're here to talk about your upcoming concert. This will be uh, September 16th at 7.30 at the United First Parish Church, the Church of Presidents uh, in Quincy Center. Uh, viol Vignettes, uh, celebrating forgotten viol players through music and storytelling. And as you mentioned, tickets are available. And uh, is there a, a website for folks to go to? Uh, yeah. Um... So we have an Eventbrite page that uh, there's a link to um, uh, on our website, lyricalmusic.com, um, under our uh, uh, on our events page on our website. Great. So tell me about that show. What is going to be happening that evening? Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, so the we 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 mentioned this a little bit earlier that you know rather than. Um, picking music for our concerts based around composers, for example, um, we, you know, research people who play the viol um, and figure out what we can about their musical lives um, and then sort of pick music to, to decorate the narrative that we want to tell uh, about their lives. Um, and so this concert, uh, we've divided into three different vignettes. Um, and uh, one of the one of the ways that we put our, our grant funds to use is that we're uh, bringing in an actor to collaborate with us and to to do the the narrated parts um, of the of the concert. Um, so the first vignette is uh, about a woman named Anne Ford. Yeah, Anne Ford had a pretty um, crazy musical story. So she was a, a London socialite. And in her early 20s, she was uh, pursued by a man who was about 40 years her senior. Mm -hmm. And she was just really not interested in, in that. <laughs> um, but her father thought it was a great idea. So she ran away from him and she appealed to her very wealthy friends 
uh, for funds to launch a concert series by which she intended to become financially independent from her father. And they they fronted her the money. She rented out a theater um, in London's Haymarket, of all places. And in 1760 and 61, um, she ran this very successful concert series and invited the most illustrious musicians of London to perform with her. And um, one really cool thing is that we many of her concert programs um, are still extant. So, you know, we'll be playing pieces that we know she played on the viol or sang or um, accompanied herself own singing on uh, with the viol. Um, and we'll have our actor friend, Danielle Boyven, <laughs> um, read, you know, from those concert programs and read from a very cheeky pamphlet that she wrote about her experience putting this series together. So that's that's our first vignette. And each vignette's about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, then our second vignette. Yeah, is, is um, uh, his name was Dudley Ryder. And at the time of, of him, him writing this diary, he was an English uh, law student. Um, but he, uh, you know, from time to time in his diary wrote bits about just how he just loves playing the viol for fun or like his experiences in his lessons. Um, it's, it seems pretty likely that he studied with the son of, uh, saint Colomb, who was a very well-renowned, um, French viol player. Um, and he talks about, you know, going over to the such and such's house and playing music together or someone came over to his house and they played some duets together. Um, and so we've, we've brought in to collaborate with us, uh, Arnie Tanimoto, um, who is a terrific viol player, um, to, to, to play some duets with me, um, <laughs> as, as well as some, some other things, you know, on the, uh, on the third vignette, um, in our program, um, which, uh, takes place, um, in the late uh, 16th century in Japan, during a time when uh, the the government at the time uh, allowed Jesuit missionaries from Japan, uh, sorry, from uh, Portugal, um, to Spain and Italy, and Spain and yeah. Italy to to come into Japan and set up schools. So there were many uh, noble feudal Japanese families who had sent their boys to be educated at these Jesuit schools, and their education. Um, included a lot of learning how to play the viol and and singing, singing yeah. um, mostly in a liturgical context. Yeah. Um, but four of these boys mm -hmm. were selected to um, go on a extensive a tour. Yeah. European tour, um, basically <laughs> to kind of demonstrate their success mm -hmm. um, and the success of the Jesuit missions and convince um, European governments to give them more money so <laughs> to continue the Jesuit okay. mission. Um, and this, this video was the trickiest to put together because so much of what we, well, actually all of what we have, um, you know, is, is in the words of the, the Jesuit missionaries, not the boys themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but we really wanted to celebrate their musical experiences and musical accomplishments um, you know, a lot of the sources that we have um, say things like, you know, we went to mass and heard the boys play and sing mass with vials. They're so, you know, and then they praise their musical skills. Um, so, you know, in this colonial context, there are a lot of really harsh, ugly realities. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we s wanted to find a way to celebrate, focus on the boys and mm -hmm. celebrate their musical achievements um, that are, are worthy of, of recognition. So. Yeah. yeah, and we, we know that the boys kept diaries, um, but as, as best we know, we don't have the actual diaries. Instead, we have somebody later um, uh, took their diaries and compiled them into uh, a sort of like somewhat fictionalized they're, accounts yeah, they're, just, they, they would sort of a, a common practice at the time like if you're writing a biography is you like set the scene as like these people are in a room talking to each other and it becomes this kind of dialogue thing rather than like what we know today as as a typical um biography but and, the, this was but, written by their jesuit chaperone on the their european tour and is right it's, it's very filtered, not trustworthy. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's their it's their 
it's their thoughts filtered. It's the 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 boys' thoughts filtered through yeah. a very colonialist um, lens. It's a um, secondhand account. Essentially. Yeah, exa exactly. It's a secondhand account whose agenda is to to say, "Oh, look at how much better European culture is." Basically, I mean, that's and that's like is throughout you know um, a lot of the primary sources that that we had. Um, been looking at um yeah it took us a lot of just the yeah i mean it's the it's the unfortunate reality um it took a, a lot of digging to tease out the um sources be the letters or reports that really focused on the boys musical ability right. rather than the larger colonial agenda that they were part of um because that's what we want we want to celebrate the boys right. not this right you know yeah. celebrate <laughs> celebrate their accomplishments while still you know acknowledging that this was the that this was the the context sure sure now, a, interesting at, at the show on uh, on september 16th do you actually talk about these vignettes before you perform them like you're talking with me about them now with, with the audience yeah uh, not in as much detail um but well but in i mean in a sense i mean the the uh you know they usually start with a little bit of historical framing and then the rest of it is is it's mostly readings from the primary sources mm -hmm. letters uh, diaries stories. reports yeah. and yeah. then you know the music mentioned so there most of the readings are brief maybe 30 seconds okay. and then we follow each reading with music that mm -hmm. uh relates to it okay yeah so it really is a good, kind of a continual story uh yeah as, as yeah Thanks. yeah so in this case of the last vignette, you know, the music is um, music that there's, you can make a case that the boys would have played at mm -hmm. the, the schools um, or played and heard while they were on tour in Europe. Um, and we also have one book we'll be, I'll be singing from that's um, a book of liturgical chant. Mm -hmm. That was the first book uh, of Western notation to be printed in Japan in 1605. So when they went back to Europe, when they went to Europe, they actually were gifted a printing press and brought that back with them and published this book of, of you know, Catholic liturgical mm -hmm. chant yeah. in Japan in 1605. Yeah. So we, we do have that as well that we'll be performing from. Yeah, really interesting. Well, um, what do you kind of hope... Uh, you know, your audiences will take away from your performances, uh, James and Ashley. Is there is there kind of an, an overall message that you'd like uh, folks to take away? Yeah, um, I I think there is. We haven't necessarily sat down and, <laughs> and thought of a like one sentence that will that will encapsulate that. But um, I mean, in in all our concerts, we want you know people to just hear. Uh, music that they might not have heard before or hear music that they might have heard before, but contextualized in a different way um, or played in a different way. Um, and we'd also like to um, encourage people to think more broadly about the people over history who contributed to what we now call Western classical music um, and, you know, have people get a, get, get the understanding that it, wasn't just a few great, mm -hmm. you know, composers who um, we can celebrate, but we can also celebrate a much wider range of people who who made music. Um, Those Bach and Beethovens, they get all the press, you know. Yeah, <laughs> they, I they mean, do. They, they do get all the. I press, mean, yeah. and they're fantastic, and I love Bach, <laughs> but um, there's more. Ch there's there's a lot of, of other things that are great too. So. <laughs> Again, it is September 16th, 7.30. And what was the, um, I'm curious, um, the impetus for performing at the uh, church, at the United First Paris Church? How did that work go? Yeah. Um, well, one factor is that it's, you know, right in the heart of Quincy Center and um, very easily accessible um, by by train mm -hmm. uh, and, and bus as well. Um, uh, is that, I think that was, that was probably the main consideration. Yeah, it's and, right kind of in the heart of the community and people know it and recognize it and know how to get there you know yeah. and it's the kind of place where you know someone could walk by and see oh there's a concert happening rather than it kind of being like you know tucked away in like the basement of a whatever <laughs> <laughs> sure sure and it's, and it's uh, the acoustics in the in the sanctuary are actually quite good um, mm -hmm. as well i think folks will, will enjoy the, uh, that venue for sure mm -hmm. have you had any other performances since last we chatted back in 2020 yeah mm -hmm. yeah so the i think the the 
um, mainly the performances that we did um, were of a, a program that grew out of the, the video that we um, produced and, and shared with you last time. Um, so expanding on the context of um, making music at home on the viol uh, in colonial Massachusetts. Um, we, uh, we performed that uh, a couple of times at the, I think it's the Sudbury History Museum, which is a, a historic house um, out in Sudbury. Um, we also, uh, this was very exciting, we got a chance to collaborate uh, with Barbara Lambert, who is a, a scholar whose research like, was sort of the, the backbone of, of us being able to put together this program. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got to do a collaboration with her um, at the uh, Colonial uh, Society of Massachusetts, Massachusetts. on Beacon Hill, yeah. uh -huh. uh, where she, she did a short lecture uh, at the beginning and then we, and then we did, did the concert. Um, we were invited to perform on the Early Music Missouri concert series in St. Louis. Um, and tomorrow we leave to Chapel Hill, North Carolina to perform um, on the concert series at um, UNC Chapel Hill and to coach students there. So we're, we're very, very excited. excited about that. <laughs> wow, I'm excited for you both. This is a, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I'm sure something that uh, you probably never dreamed would be as big as it is right now. Yeah. <laughs> we just kind of go one day at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> well, good for you. I, I remember last time, James, I, I asked if you had to happen to have a vial handy, if you could if you could show us what it looked like and maybe just a quick uh, example of what it sounded like. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to, I'll, I'll, I'll go grab it. Okay. <laughs> I thought about that before we started. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, actually, we'll remind folks again, it's... Um, Lyrical presenting of viol vignettes, uh, celebrating forgotten viol players through music and storytelling. September 16th, 7.30 p.m., United First Parish Church in Quincy Center. And again, that website uh, for folks? Is uh, lyricalmusic.com. Okay, very good. And, and lyrical is L-Y-R-A-C-L-E. -E. <laughs> very good. Yes, that's a good, a good reminder for folks, too. Um, is there a... Um, uh, deadline at all to, to purchase tickets? No, um, tickets are available online and will also be available at the door. So walk-ins are welcome. Okay, and that's a Friday evening. Um, and are there any um, COVID restrictions folks should be aware of? Um, we will ask that um, all, uh, well, all audience members will be required to mask, but that's it. Okay, very good. And no, I'm guessing no age uh, requirements, right? It's, it's all ages? Uh, yeah, all ages. Okay, very good. Yep. Yeah, and we're we're happy for, you know, um young people, middle schoolers, high schoolers to, to come um and you know see this instrument they may not have seen before and um the concert will be um about an hour and a half total. So <laughs> any breaks in, in the concert, any intermission at all? Probably not. We might take a brief pause at some point. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll be probably an hour fifteen, hour and a half max. Okay, yeah. Um, folks can prepare accordingly, sure. Very good. Yeah, if you can hold that up just a little bit higher first before you play, just so we can get a yeah, glimpse at it. Okay, so yeah, I see what you mean about the, the cello comparison. Uh, yeah. The fret, yeah. Awesome. Okay. yeah, so it is it is a different it's a separate family of instruments yeah. uh, from the violin family. Um, you can see Which the, the cello was the part. crest there. Yeah, huh? right. The cello is part of the violin family, um, and this is part of the viol family. <laughs> and what talk um, about that particular instrument, James? Where does that have a? What is that history with you? Um, yeah. So this, so this instrument. Um, so, so most viols that you'll see these days are are modern reproductions. Um, so this was made by a maker uh, named uh, Dominic Zukovich, who was active in. Uh, in Canada for many years, um, and uh, I, you know, happened across this instrument. Uh, someone had been had been trying to sell it, um, and my my teacher at the time, you know, had uh, became aware of it and uh, had them send it to her, and I tried it, and and it was great, and I bought it. Okay, um, and it's and it's served me very well so far. Are there but different I, types of vials? Is that a particular type of a vial? Yeah, so this is a this is a bass vial. Um, you and bass vials sometimes have six strings and sometimes have seven strings. Um, the seventh string is an extra low one on the bottom. Um, there are also uh, tenor and treble 
uh, vials. A tenor is maybe uh, about about this big, and a treble is around this big. Um, and uh, and then there's there's even smaller. It's called the Partisu from France, and then there's a bigger one that's um, called the Violone that's closer to the size of a double bass. Oh. Um, and there's there's all sorts of variety because these instruments weren't standardized the way that modern instruments offer. Sure. Yeah. So that's something that shows, you know, nice, sweet sounds uh, and chordal playing. Um, and that's, uh, that, that piece is from uh, the early 1600s. Um, and I'll, I'll play a, a little bit of something else. Uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of improvising. Um, and this is in kind of a style that you would hear in the mid uh, 16th century um, in sort of an Italian style. It does have a unique sound. It, it, uh, yeah. If you, if I, if I couldn't see the instrument and was trying to pinpoint it, I would, I guess, I would say a cello. Uh, but you know, right. if you see it. It has almost a guitar twang to it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and if I can, if I can play a little bit more of, of something else. Um, it also happens that this instrument sounds great um, for, let's say, jazzier things. So if I were to, you know, and, and playing it plucked, it has this really warm. Or, you know, we can... Completely different, yeah. You know, that, that, sort of, that sort of kind of thing. Um, I like to play lots of different kinds of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we don't we don't want to give away too much. We just give folks a little. A sure. Little <laughs> yeah. Well, to, well, to hear that, you'd have to come to one of my one of my solo performances uh, once I figure out when those are going to be. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you have to let us know. But in the in the short term, it's uh, September sixteenth, seven thirty. Lyrical presenting a vial vignettes at the United First Parish Church in Quincy Center. Um, anything else we should let folks know about? Uh, no, I think we've covered a lot. <laughs> We sure have. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you both, and I wish you uh, great success in uh, your your show here in Quincy and in your your future performances. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for so having much. us. <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs>